We are very pleased to have Chris Hills, Chief Security Strategist from Beyond Trust to lead this session. I will do a quick introduction about Chris. Uh, Chris has more than 15 years experience as a senior security and architecture engineering operating in highly sensitive environment. Chris started with Beyond Trust after his uh, most recent role leading a privileged access management team as a technical director within a Fortune 500 organizations. And Chris will talk about uh, why zero trust, why now? And he will also touch on cyber insurance, digital transformation, and the ransomware. There are a lot of information you can take from Chris's presentation. All right, Chris, all yours. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Let me get my screen shared here. So as Brian mentioned, my name is Chris Hills. I'm a chief security strategist here at Beyond Trust. Prior to this engagement, uh, I've, been with, I've been with Beyond Trust for three plus years. Uh, I was at Charles Schwab. Uh, there I was technical director leading the charge for everything related to PAM, uh, architecture, engineering, operations, you name it. Uh, today, obviously, I'm your host. And so uh, we're going to talk about, you know, zero trust. Why now? And maybe there's some things in here that you already know relative to zero trust. But the idea is, and I, I really want to do the forward thinking, is to really expose you to what is causing this whole why zero trust? Why now? The cyber insurance, the ransomware and everything else. And for sake of time, because as Brian mentioned, there is a lot of content in here. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, Brian will make these available to you if you want to download them, review them and have all of them here. But this is our agenda that we're really going to just dive through really quick. So uh, without further ado, let's talk about it. So zero trust. As everybody has heard, we we probably are bleeding from the ears as a result of it. But ultimately, you know, what is it? What is is it? This buzzword phenomena? Is it a solution? Is it a product? Is it a company? Is it is a strategy? Is it a philosophy? Ultimately, everything has been blurred as a result of everything you've heard. And so, from uh, get a little bit of background here, from its original inception, John Kinderbag, who was a former uh, former Forester VP and analyst. It was actually introduced by him because of the original trust model being broken, which was trust, but verify. And that original model with that concept of your trusted users, your trusted networks, your trusted interfaces, ideally was all trusted, but none of the verification was being done because that traffic, those users and everything else was again trusted. So sounds legitimate, right? But at the end of the day, Ultimately, zero trust, the concept and philosophy is about not trusting anyone and everyone technically is untrusted, which makes sense. And in order to trust them, you have to verify them first. So this concept, as you can imagine, and philosophy or strategy over the years has ultimately gained more exposure as a result of the pandemic and everything else. And it really has become a popular buzzword amongst the industry, amongst marketing, and amongst everyone else who tries to leverage on the zero trust, or is, is uh, you'll see here in a second, zero trust architecture. And as a result, and I'm sure John would agree with me, that zero trust idea behind it truly has been twisted um, in the market and in the space. And up until now, there really hasn't been anything to benchmark zero trust against other than, hey, it's a philosophy or, you know, to achieve it is, is this solution. And ultimately it really isn't. It's not just about one solution. So when we think about this and we think about what zero trust is in terms of a framework, ultimately it's still fairly vague when it comes to specific technology related and how to actually implement that. But here's the key, here's the big but. The NIST 800-207, which was created and spe specifically talks about zero trust, is ultimately gonna be the primary source and resource for what zero trust is and what zero trust architecture is. And so ideally, if you've had a chance to look at that, great. If you haven't, I highly, highly encourage you. It's a not a long read. I think it's about 26 pages. Um, but this is what I, I challenge you with. For what you think or what you've heard Zero Trust is and what Zero Trust is about, um, whether you've heard it in the vendor marketing pitches or whether you've heard hyped up things about Zero Trust, Zero Trust architecture, I encourage you to challenge what you're hearing and reference that off of that NIST 800-207 special publication. Because what you're going to find out 
is, is that NIST will go through, and we're going to talk about this here in a second, but NIST goes through and breaks down the definitions. It breaks down what is required for zero trust architecture, and it really allows you to dispel this hype or this phenomena around what zero trust truly is. And, and ideally, this the NIST 800-207 is going to be that benchmark for zero trust architecture moving forward. So, one of the, the beauties of this, right? And when we talk about, I wanna say the definitions of what zero trust and zero trust architecture is, everybody over the years has ultimately had their own definition, their own vision of what they think it is, how to accomplish it. And ideally the very first thing in the 800-207 that NIST does is it actually breaks out two specific definitions. The first one is zero trust, which ultimately is defined as an evolving set of cybersecurity paradigms that move defenses from that static network-based perimeter to focus more on the users, the assets, and the resources. When you think about where we're at and where, where we're going, ultimately we were in this castle, this old concept of the castle and moat, where the traditional network security boundary being that network protecting everything inside of that network, similar to how a moat protects a castle, while everything inside of the perimeter essentially is trusted inside that moat in the castle and it's free to roam. Ultimately in today's era, in today's age, um, this concept just isn't good enough anymore. And while I look, I'm not here to tell you that network or security or perimeter security is done and gone because it's not. Instead, we ultimately need to shift and talk about, you know, now how we are going to protect the users, the assets, the resources, and the workflows inside of the perimeter. And what's even more interesting in that NIST 800-207 is it not only provides you a definition of what zero trust is, but then it provides you a second definition of what zero trust architecture is and what makes up zero trust architecture. And some of you may be scratching your head, wondering, well, how, how is that? Why is it not one and the same? And ultimately the zero trust architecture piece is, is really important because it centers everything related to what zero trust is. And so ultimately when you look at that definition, zero trust architecture is a cybersecurity plan. So let me repeat that. Zero trust architecture is a cybersecurity plan that utilizes zero trust principles and encompasses component relationship, workflow planning and access policies. So now you can really start to see that look, zero trust and in order to achieve zero trust requires zero trust architecture. It's not about one solution. Instead, it's more about multiple solutions working together to achieve a common goal of zero trust. So why zero trust and why now? And some of you may know the answer to this and some of you may not. When we talked about, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about digital transformation and, and how the market has evolved and what's driving the market. Ultimately, digital transformation, at the end of the day, the pandemic has forced, you know, we're going back two years, but the pandemic has forced every company to embrace some form of digital transformation. In, the, in their industry, whatever it may be. Ultimately, companies you know, were, were forced to send people home. They were forced to figure out how to become one, more agile with their users, how to enable their users. And two, how do they get the applications that are normally in that moat and castle scenario into the hands of their end users that are no longer in the confines of the brick and mortar building? And so ultimately, if they didn't, they were going to be left behind and they were going to suffer revenue loss at the end of the day. So companies had to digitally transform. And ultimately, at the end of the day, security wasn't at the forefront of a lot of those decisions. I'm not saying all the decisions, but there were some decisions that were made that really didn't have security at the forefront of that. And so that leads into the next piece of what's driving the market. Look, at the end of the day, all of us are working more remotely or telecommuting. And maybe for some of you, it's been an ongoing thing, but for a lot of companies out there in the market today, remote work really wasn't a thing. Maybe you know you have some executives or maybe some people that would remote in occasionally. And now companies are really having to embrace, hey, I need, my, I need employees to work from home. And now that they're working from home, guess what? We're gonna talk about this here in a second, but the remote worker has now been shifted as the primary target in a lot of the bad actor things that are going on and the breaches and whatnot. The last piece that really 
drives the market right now. And some of you might be experiencing this and some of you might not. But when we talk about the regulations, the compliance, the regulatory and the fines, a lot of companies are being audited right now. You know, we're at the, I want to say the tail end of the pandemic. Look, and, you know, maybe, maybe that's a stretch for some of you. Um, but ideally, I, I hope that we're on the downside of the pandemic side. And ultimately, there's a lot of audits that are occurring. There's a lot of compliance checks that are being, you know, gone through and companies are struggling. They're finding out that there's a lot of things and maybe some decisions that they made that weren't in their best interest in terms of their security posture. And now they're having to go find security solutions to bridge or mitigate those risks that, that, that they were actually found. So that's another thing that's really driving the market. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, this really builds to the success of cybercrime being a big business. Some of you might have heard of ransomware as a service. It's a real thing. Um, and so when we talk about, okay, what's changed? What does the market look like now? Maybe when you compare it to pre-COVID. Ultimately, from a ransomware standpoint, when you think about what's changed, the primary purpose of an attack pre-COVID was around PII and PHI data. And when you start to look at some of the most notable breaches pre-COVID, for instance, just that, the Yahoo data breach, right? 2014, 500 million accounts, 2017, 3 billion accounts. It was all of that PII information. Experian, for those of you that were affected by that, I was 200 million accounts. Marriott, 2018, 500 million accounts. Ultimately, that was the primary purpose. Maybe it was credit card, maybe it was your home, maybe it was your identity or other types of PII information related as a result of those breaches. So ultimately, what changed? When we talk about the pre-COVID and where ultimately the Fortune 500 companies were the primary target and the small to medium mid-market businesses really didn't see that many attacks. And cyber insurance obviously really didn't see that many you know, types of claims and whatnot compared to what we're seeing now. So what ultimately changed? Well, 2019 is now being considered and looked at as the big bang or the big change, the COVID spike ultimately provided camouflage for the activities, as I mentioned earlier, the remote working and the digital transformation, the largest being the remote working. And as companies, businesses, people, and technology had to change, so did our adversaries. And ultimately, the cyber criminals of the world, guess what? They evolved too. And so they changed and morphed from going for that PII and PHI as their primary focus. And now we're, we're actually seeing the ransomware far surpass what we've seen. And from a data exfiltration point of this, the PII and PHI aspect is now being considered as the cherry on top when they go in and, and you get ransomware and they're able to exfiltrate data. That really is the cherry on top. And the downtime of this is actually being seen as the biggest disruptor of a breach because if they can interrupt the company, that has the biggest financial impact. So ultimately, when you look at the stats here, up 311%, downtime 23 days, companies are looking to mitigate that downtime because that's 23 days of losing money. And when it comes down to the point of paying a ransomware to reduce that 23 days, some of you may be shocked at the statistics here, but ultimately that's what's happening. So who's impacted the most? When we talk about who's impacted the most, this might surprise you. I love this slide. I worked with my uh, sales enablement team. And ultimately, here's the bad actor. He's basically coming after the customer, hits the customer, customer takes the breach right in the eye, and by the time they react, it's too late. So some of you might be sitting there laughing while you're watching this. It really is about, hey, this is what's truly happening in the world. And when we talk about the largest targets by industry and size, ideally, I want you to look at this and I want you to see this and I want you to kind of you know digest this. When you start looking at the industries, professional services industries are the primary target. Now, when you look at the size, I don't have the actual percentage number up there, but I know what the percentage number is. When you add up the size of companies, 81% of the companies with 1,000 employees or less make up the largest primary purpose for attacks in the bad actor state. So when you think about who's being affected, Again, companies with 1,000 employees or less make up 81% of that market share that the bad actors are going after. So for those of you who might be thinking professional services, why is professional services so big? I hear about this. I hear about that. Look, at the end of the day, when we think about professional services, think about potentially a law firm. 
And when you think about a law firm and you think about the data that a law firm has, and in the event that that ends up in the wrong hands, maybe due to a breach, maybe due to a compromise, or even a, you know, a ransomware with data exfiltration, if that ends up in the wrong hands for their clients or their customers, and, and that could be some really bad data. So the likelihood of a professional services company paying a ransomware in order to make sure they get their data back intact is, is high, has a very high likelihood. So that ultimately is what's driving that statistic. This is a cohort statistic, uh, Q4 2020, I believe. So fairly relevant, not much has changed in the last two years, maybe a little bit here and there, but this gives you kind of the big picture. We are seeing the small to mid market taking the largest impact. And ultimately they just don't have the mature security programs a lot of your Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies have to spend on that security maturity. So we talk about the paradigm shift. We talk about this shift to zero trust. Ultimately, assets, users, and devices, they're, they're just not confined to that physical structure, that castle, that security perimeter. But instead, now we're scattered across all environments, remote working, and this new cloud-based universe. And ultimately, you can't rely on network controls to do your security anymore. So digital transformation, as a result, including cloud and workforce mobility, has vastly expanded the attack surface. When we talk about the zero trust model, it brings a lot of focus to the potential that something or someone within the network ultimately has been compromised. And under the assumption that every user, every request and every server is untrusted until proven otherwise, a zero trust solution ultimately and dramatically, you know, continues to assess and trust every user at a time and every request to every resource at that time. And this approach ultimately prevents the attackers from exploiting the weaknesses, the weaknesses in the perimeter to gain that entry, right? And then once inside, once we still have that zero trust, what do they want to do? They want to move laterally and instead we can actually confine them to a specific area in the event of the inevitable. So ultimately here, and this is where some of you might have heard maybe some concepts for JIT, or just in time and some of the things that Pam can offer in that and, and how that really relates. So when we talk about the path to zero trust and we talk about, you know, ultimately how do we get there? <laughs> NIST does provide a pretty clear playbook on how to adopt the zero trust principles. And ultimately organizations are now really starting to embrace a lot of the zero trust frameworks and building these into their security strategies. Again, for those of you that have not, have not looked at the NIST 800-207, what I can tell you is I believe it's five or six different reference architectures that make up uh, some varying pieces of, of NIST and the, the zero trust in order to accomplish zero trust. Ultimately, you know what, I've, I've talked about this before, we can all relate to this analogy. So how many of you have experienced this and have been you know, in a work environment where you know there's a server sitting somewhere that is running some archaic version of Windows 2000, maybe 2003, and your company is deathly afraid to shut it off. It, it, it's a very true scenario. Maybe it might be a slightly newer OS, maybe it's a different OS, but we've all been there. We are deathly afraid to turn this off because it is gonna take down something and we don't want it to take it down. So what do we do? We leave it on. Well, ultimately, this provides a really great use case for having an enclave resource and putting that system within that zero trust architecture for having that resource enclave aspect of it. Because those operating systems at the end of the day just can't take advantage of the modern security updates and principles. And there's a lot of exploits and vulnerabilities because those systems haven't been patched. So having that and moving that into an environment as a resource enclave for zero trust really allows you to protect that use case relative to that. And again, it's, it's just an analogy that we can all really uh, embrace and you know relate to because we've all most, I want to say not all of us, but most of us have been there. Most of us have, have been in an environment like that. So when we talk about zero trust momentum, where it's at and what we're doing and how we're moving forward. Ideally, at the end of the day, you can see here 93%, this is a 2021 trends in security identities right here, but 93% of IT security professionals say zero trust 
is strategic to them to securing their organization, right? And then when we talk about, you know, the other piece of this, 97% of them agree that identity, we talk about identity as the new perimeter, right? Is the foundational component to zero trust model. And again, you know, no identities are more important to protect than the ones with privilege. And we're doing more with less at the end of the day. And ultimately, when we start thinking about cloud environments and we start thinking about the identities that are in a cloud and how we can, with one click of a button, push resources, push servers, deploy, and all the identities and all the privileges that are associated with them, there's a lot of ground there that, that provides that attack service for a bad actor in the event of a compromise for them to leverage against us. So when we talk about <laughs> zero trust success, and ideally, you know, this really is critical to the path of success because ultimately um, you have that end user interaction, you have the daily operations, and ultimately at the end of the day, privilege access really is that special use case that's gonna be able to make the changes, modify the systems, and even potentially control the zero trust model itself. So you need to be able to say, okay, I'm gonna do this, but I'm gonna control this with zero trust. And when we think about those privilege accounts being some of the most important, whether they're to your application servers, whether they're to your Windows, Unix, Linux, maybe the two of your domain controllers, ultimately you have to be able to say at the end of the day, I need to be able to monitor these and I need to be able to enforce the policies each and every day for configuration, for operations, maybe it's for setup, maybe it's just for viewing the logs or something else that's on there on the system. Because ultimately, if I have privilege access on a system and we don't monitor it, that is a potential risk to the organization. And this is ultimately why PAM lines up so well with the zero trust model, because it's those privileged accounts that potentially have the means to bypass all of the security controls Ultimately, that we've kind of talked about it. And they, at the end of the day, they must be part of the zero trust model too. <clears throat> One of the other things that's important here is you really have to prevent the lateral movement for when, let's say, someone gets an admin account access or even root access. Why? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's things like ransomware. It's things like malware. It's things like bad actors and everything else that will absolutely take advantage if you leave those controls outside of the zero trust model. And so for those of you that are familiar, I don't have a slide on this. We talked about it before, but the anatomy of an attack, the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. We talk about the anatomy of an attack and what the, the steps that an attacker must go through and lateral movement is part of that. And if we can't control the lateral movement aspect of it, they're gonna to continue to probe through lateral movement for more privilege and privilege elevation, privilege escalation when those privileged accounts are in there. So that's the, the biggest key here is trying to stop that lateral movement attack. So three principles to zero trust model. The first one is requiring secure and authenticated access to all assets, right? This ultimately falls under the segmentation window. The second piece of this is adopting a least privilege model and forcing access control. This is the micro segmentation piece of this. And then you have log and inspect all activities. And ultimately, this isn't about, hey, I'm going to check a box. I'm going to send all the logs, ARC site, sys logs, whatever to send, never to be seen again, but we check the box. No, somebody needs to be reviewing those logs. That is part of that, because that way you can find those anomalies in that behavior and actually respond to it. That is a key component in the zero trust. So eight ways PAM enables zero trust. Discoveries, inventories, and, and smart groups, right? At the end of the day, a PAM solution needs to be able to discover and inventory all assets, all accounts, all privileges, and be able to regurgitate that back to you so you can see where those privileges exist. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's not about the accounts that you know about that pose the biggest risk to your organization. Instead, it's the accounts that you don't know about. So having an automated way to discover and inventory that so that you can see it and then make that educated decision on whether or not, hey, this needs to exist in your environment. And oh, by the way, we're going to actually bring that in under management is a key component. The other piece of this, the second piece is the continuously enforce. Ideally, the adaptive and the just-in-time aspect for control-based, context-based, right? When we start talking about maybe PAM in the, in the realm of 
uh, endpoint security or complete endpoint security, we need to continually enforce this and we need to remove the ability for users to be operating on their endpoints with administrative rights. They need to operate as a standard user. And when they need to elevate their rights, we can do that in a just-in-time manner. The third thing here, manage, manages and enforce, right? When we, when we talk about credential security and best practices, look, at the end of the day, you can put all of the PAMS pieces, features, solutions in, but if you're not going to use them, you're not going to manage, you're not going to enforce password credential rotation or session management, what's the point in, in bringing in a PAM solution? Let the PAM solution do what it does best. Follow the best practices and let PAM do all of your management, all of your enforcement for your passwords, your secrets, your SSH keys. The fourth piece here is apply least privilege. Look, at the end of the day, a lot of, a lot of people come up to me and ask me, hey, Chris, how do we implement this? And I always tell everybody, you start with the broadest and widest access, and then you basically start narrowing down from there. So let's say you're not guys who go out, they do change tickets, they need access to all the systems. That's your broadest and widest. And then you have application teams that are at the bottom of this funnel, right? They don't need access to all the Windows servers or all the Unix Linux servers. They only need access to their systems that their application runs on. And basically you carve out that funnel and that's how you implement that. Number five, when we talk about the implementation of segmentation and micro segmentation, being able to isolate the assets, the resources, and using that strict lateral movement piece, not allowing them to be able to browse or maybe be able to go to other systems, you know, through a lateral movement aspect. The sixth piece here, secure remote access. Look, at the end of the day, the bad actors know that remote access is still one of the top attack vectors for them to gain access into your environment. So utilizing a secure remote access solution to leverage, maybe it's a bastion host or a jump host in order to gain access while you're still being able to record and keystroke and maybe even do some password injection is key. So that way you don't have that car blanche VPN client that is running maybe on a vendor, maybe a third party, or maybe even employee, you know, a laptop, could be hardened, but at the end of the day, if that laptop gets compromised and they make that VPN connection into your corporate network environment, guess what? Everything that hangs off on that network is now susceptible. Number seven here, secure access and control planes. It doesn't matter whether it's DevOps, whether it's cloud, whether it's your virtual instances, or even your sensitive applications. Make sure you're doing your due diligence. And that way, you whether it's a you know Microsoft Red Forest where you have a tier zero, tier one, tier two architecture, make sure those environments aren't able to cross talk to one another. Once again, the lateral movement aspect. And then ultimately continuous monitoring, managing and, and audits. Don't just check that box and say, hey, I'm sending the logs to SIM, the Splunk or anything else, right? Make sure whoever's looking at that or whoever's getting those logs is reviewing them. Because ultimately at the end of the day, knowing where those logs sit and how those logs and that data is coming in will provide that first initial step into those behavior anomalies that occur. So really quick, one of the things that I wanna jump in here, ransomware supplemental addendum. I know we're, we're running short on time, but ultimately the ransomware supplemental addendum was created by cyber insurance brokers and was in, uh, basically introduced to the world in uh, the cyber world in 2021, beginning of 2021. These are nine categories that the cyber insurance brokers want to see positive responses. The boxes in orange are where PAM really resonates and provides positive responses. The boxes in blue, again, provides dotted lines. Products PAM should be able to integrate and ingest multi-factor. Patch management, if you're doing inventory and you're able to bring all that inventory back both on system servers and about privilege accounts, guess what? There's a dotted line here. And lastly, disaster recovery and backups. We have, I have a whole session on cyber insurance, but ultimately PAM in itself should really be able to ingest and be configured in a disaster recovery and have the ability to do backups. Here's our product portfolio, right? We talk about privilege password management. We talk about secure remote access. We talk about endpoint privilege management. And then we talk about cloud security management. Being able to do all of these things through a single pane of glass, and being able to manage all of your cloud security, maybe your endpoint security, or maybe it's your remote access or even your PAM environments. And while we do have a bunch of resources on our website, you can go to our website, beyondtrust.com, 
forward slash white papers, forward slash resources. And there's a bunch of different pieces here. So uh, without further ado, that's the end of my session. That's a lot of data in 30 minutes. If you'd like to feel free to add me on LinkedIn, LinkedIn forward slash chills. Thanks everyone. Hope everyone has a great day.